Okay, this video is going to cover chapters 8 and 9 from Smith, so we're going to talk about epistemology and the modern rhetorics, and we're going to go all the way through existentialism. So what we see with modernism and existentialism, and I know the other video talks about this as well, is we have another paradigm shift. So the existentialists pick up on very specific ideas within modernism, and then they revolt against that. And then we're going to see the same thing happen with postmodernism, where postmodernism revolts against modernism with the influence of existentialism in there. So the epistemology and the modern rhetorics is kind of the foundation for or more modern versions of rhetorical theory and rhetorical theory development. So this section is really interesting and really important for that specific reason. It builds the foundation of our modern understanding of rhetorical theory and our modern readings of um, the ancient Greek and Roman texts. So yes, I know I'm using modern, and by modern I mean contemporary versus modern as an actual branch of theory. So the first thing that we're dealing with is epistemology. So we're back to, and this is very heavily influenced by the Renaissance, especially the Renaissance of rhetoric from the last video. Now that we have time and now that we have money to become patrons of art again, we're also going to start thinking. And so now we're going to start trying to understand what does it mean to think? What is thinking? And then how do we use thinking to make knowledge? And so the big question is, what's the relationship between rhetoric and epistemology? So when we're convincing somebody else, when we're talking to somebody else, when we're communicating, what does that have to do with the making of new knowledge and what's influenced here? How do we learn? How do we know? So then the next question is why language? And that's really important. And so we've talked about this one before. For the most part, language is a series of sign systems and it's sign systems that have been created by humans. And so the big question here is, do we think through language or is language something just for communication? And I think a lot of us, if we stop to think, yes, I understand, um, about thinking, often we think through language. We talk to ourselves in our head and we talk through thoughts. We talk as we write. We write out our ideas. And so a lot of what we're doing, we're doing through language, not just as a form of communication, but as our own internal. And so a lot of these theorists are looking at what does that mean and how does language function because of that? So then the next big question becomes, what is the mind? And they all deal with this in a slightly different way. So we start off with Descartes. I think therefore I am so he's one of the most famous for the first one saying thinking is what makes us human and what he talks about specifically is how our soul and where our soul lives and for him it's outside the mind how that influences how we think and so he comes up with Cart Cartesian sorry he comes up with Cartesian dualism so our body is an object and so you can see it here in this image this is the body and then the mind and the soul are out here so the mind and the soul live outside of our body, or they exist, is the better word for it, outside of our body, and it interacts with our body. So our body does take in sensor information, and then it sends it to our mind that would exist kind of out here, and then the mind acts upon the body. So it's this thinking that gets to be its own unique, uh, powerful entity. That's the mind. And that's really, really important because it's giving this power to the mind, even though it's outside the body, but it's separating the two. Um, so a lot of the theorists build upon that and they start to integrate after Descartes the mind with the body, which moves us towards basically faculty psychology. How do we use language to understand how the mind breaks down? And once we understand how the mind breaks down, how can we understand why we react differently in different kinds of situations? So we start with Vico, who talks about different types of words and the different types of allegories. So he's bringing myth and narrative back into the mind and the thinking discussion. How do these myths and narratives, so in his case, parola, allegory, and favola, how do these approaches to thinking shape how we think and why we think in those very specific ways. We still see arguments like this very heavily, everything related to Gamergate. So the video game issues where um, female game designers and female game critics were attacked on Twitter, um, and it shouldn't be word, they're still attacked, they still haven't been able to return to their homes, because of all of the death threats where gamers are saying, leave me and my games alone, I'm not learning anything, I'm just having fun, Vico is 
you know, hundreds of years ago saying, hang on a second, guys, what's actually going on here? How is it that we understand that we're willing to play some of these ideas? And what happens if we're not willing to buy into that particular character? So if I'm, you know, a SWAT team member, what happens if I don't want to go over here and do whatever this particular mission is? What happens to the game? What happens to another player who's okay with that? How does that function through words? And specifically, how do those words fit within an overall culture, and it's the cultural understanding that I'm thinking from. And that's where Vico is starting to push us, is if we start to think about the way that myths and narratives function rhetorically to convince us, that also means that that language becomes very culturally embedded as the basis for how and where we think from. So most of our thinking becomes shaped by whatever it is that we hold for this cultural base, but we don't necessarily reflect on that or consider, nor are we consciously aware of that. So there's this really great, terrible game that PETA put out. PETA, like people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA, they have branches that are specifically devoted to children. So they have one for young kids and then they have one for teenagers. In the young kids, they've created a series of video games to teach kids, here's why you should be vegan. And one is, one specifically they modeled off of Pokemon because they're convinced that people, kids who played Pokemon, because Pokemon is essentially animal fighting, you're going to, as a former player, fight dogs or cockfight in real life. Like, that's the transition that you make. So they make these really interesting, you guys should check it out, it's on pedakids.org. They make this really interesting transition and connection between those two ideas. And so they're attacking capitalism in various parts during the game. They're attacking Pokemon at various parts of the game, saying, here are the things that we think are going to happen. What's really interesting about it is they have these critiques in there. Some of them are subtle, some of them are very overt, but then you can't can't play as a female Pokemon because a male has to come in and rescue you. So they have rampant sexism throughout their entire game. And then the four options that you have as a player, two of them are attacks of different kinds. One is a protest and one is to hug. So as the mother of a three-year-old, what I don't want my child learning is to go and hug strangers to make things better. That's really scary. Also, as the mother of a three-year-old, the last thing I want my child to do is to stage more protests. So we have a game that has rampant sexism that's teaching young children to stage protests, which yes, they can be good, but the first place that they're going to try those out is in my house, so I'm going to protest and not eat my dinner tonight. That's not pleasant, you know, and I don't want them hugging strangers. So these are the things that it's being, that are being subtly taught. I am noticing them because rhetoric, uh, but Pete is not noticing that any of those particular behaviors could be different or could be problematic because of the culture that they're arguing from. So what Vico is trying to get at with Parola, Allegory, and Favola is how do myth and narrative build this basis? And we're going to see Jung pick up on this really, really heavily. And then how does that help us argue and make sense of the world? So as you can see, Jung's collective unconscious. Okay, the next thing that happens is Parliament begins to gain power, like real power. So we've got people running the government again. So now we need to understand how people function for very specific reasons. So we start to develop and Bacon kind of kicks us off into faculty psychology. So what is the function of the mind? We now all agree that the mind exists. We agree that we understand the world through language. So we have sensory information, we have sensory input that we turn into language and that language then helps us do something with it but we still have this divide between rhetoric and logic. So as you can see, rhetoric is still not epistemological. We descend into rhetoric as a way to convince the masses to go and do something. And all of that comes back to faculty psychology. So these five understandings are these five functions of the mind. So the mind understands, it has reason, it has imagination, it has appetites, and it has wills. So we basically, and we'll see this with our next theorist, divide this into here's where rhetoric exists and here's where logic exists. So our mind can operate in two different ways depending on the function that our mind is engaged in, the way that we're currently using and absorbing and making sense of language, we're either making sense of language with logic or we're making sense of language and events with rhetoric, which is the appetites and the wills. So we have this clear separation between what logic does and how we're using the mind logically and how we're using it rhetorically. 
So Bacon, it takes that a little bit further to talk about the why, so to inquire and invent, to examine and judge. Smith covers this all really well, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. Just notice that the functions of the mind and the functions of rhetoric, especially with appetites and will, have very specific ways of making sense. So we're really trying to outline basically what becomes full psychology. How does our mind function and how does it work and what goes on while we're going through all of this? Um, he divides communication into three realms, so the organon of tradition the method of tradition and then the illustration of tradition. So these are the ways that we can use the mind to help make sense of communication and we can use communication to effectively communicate to other people. What he adds really well are the dangers of language. We have the idols of the tribe, the idols of the den, the idols of the marketplace, and the idols of the theater. Each of these four are ways that we use language or ways that we communicate that can persuade and corrupt through language. So language is not always good. The goal with faculty psychology, especially because of these dangers that Bacon, um, that Bacon outlines, or we need to purify language. We need to convince people to use language in a more pure way so that we don't fall victim to these four ways. So we need to bring logic back into our language, back into our communication so that we'll stop descending into rhetoric. We see ideas of this picked up on in postmodernism with Habermas. So how do we divide the public sphere and how do we have better political conversation in the public sphere when we start to purify language? So I would say the the circus, let's call it a circus, that is our current election cycle is absolutely not what Bacon is arguing for. We're falling victim to the four different idols for all sorts of various reasons. And so what Bacon wants to do, and then ultimately Habermas wants to do, is if we purify language, we purify communication, and we as a human take a better approach to these kinds of communications, a more self-reflective, a more metacognitive approach. So we're thinking about thinking and we're really considering the function of our communication. We'll get away from rhetoric and we'll get back to logic, which is really, really important because then society is going to function better. Okay, so Locke picks up on this and Locke is the everyone, all humans are created equal. <clears throat> and what he adds to this is, and you can see right here, we build a line, logic rhetoric. These are the way that things work. Um, and Locke's big addition is the tabula rasa. So we are born as blank slates and then we fill everything in after we're born. Um, a lot of people argue with this and it's been fairly overthrown at this point. I talk about that in the other video, but what we want to know about Locke is the way that our mind and our, our you know, our thinking center become the center of everything. And so then we start to categorize our knowledge into abstractions. So Locke is taking Bacon a step further to say, and he's also obviously building on Vico, it's not just that myth and narrative function rhetorically and then they build this cultural center for us to make knowledge from, but we have very specific ideas that are attracted to each other for very specific reasons. So if we go back to my PETA video game example, the creators of that particular PETA video game are not a associating the, the feminist and the patriarch ideas that are being perpetuated by that particular game with the goals of PETA. PETA wants to overthrow capitalism and they want to turn everybody vegan. There's no place in that for sexism. I, we could talk about all of the sexism with PETA later. But what Locke is saying, and it's very true in this particular example, is certain ideas become attracted to other ideas, and that attraction makes us ignore or oversee or just kind of bypass the other issues that are going on. So in this case, because PETA sees these particular ideas as connected, so down with Pokemon, down with animal fighting, all kids need to be vegan, you know, and this is the best approach to veganism is getting along with strangers and um, civil protest, those are the ideals that they're attempting to teach. And so because they're all combined together, what's not influencing them and what they're probably not even seeing are some of the dangers of those particular approaches to the family unit, to the parents, to that child's safety in the everyday world. That's not a consideration because those ideals are not close enough. So when we talk about categories of knowledge with abstractions and connections, 
that's what Locke is getting at. Why do certain ideas influence each other and why do other ideas not influence each other? Another great example of this is the abortion debate. People who are pro-abortion can't understand why people are anti-abortion. And on both sides of the issue, it comes down to what is it that we think is meaningful where or what aspect of culture is it that we're arguing from, that we're understanding from, and how does that influence how we make sense logically? And that's what Locke's trying to understand. Why do certain ideas influence us and other ideas don't so that we just completely ignore or don't even notice that they're happening? And then what happens when that happens? Okay, the next section is the enlightened women and you're going to read further on this and so the other video covers it. Um, the big thing to take away from the enlightened women is instead of women attempting to join the public sphere, women are arguing for how do we encourage further rhetorical development because women need to be educated because they need to educate their children. We've talked about this multiple times in this um, in this course so far. Now that we have that rhetorical education, how can we use it in the sphere that we have access to, they're not using the term sphere, that's the Kemptel Habermas, but in the sphere that they have access to, so in this case the salons, so that they can influence government, they can influence political life, so that their views can be taken seriously. So the enlightened women, especially Discovery, Cavendish, Fell, and Astle, are all trying to approach this situation and say, okay, here's where we are, here's what we know, here's what we need, how do we make that happen? And they have different approaches, but all of them are attempting to make the life of women better for all women. Hume comes next with his idea of skepticism. So how is it that we can use deductive reasoning in a very specific way so that we can limit the need for rhetoric? Um, next, we have more focus on faculty psychology. We've changed some of the categories a little bit, but for the most part, they all stick around. Will, understanding, memory, imagination, um, and affections. And then we have Smith who adds taste and then the way that taste and style um, influence all of this, the way that prudence influence all, influences all of this. We still see elements of this very heavily in, especially in literary theory. So how do ideas of taste and of value and of style of what's considered a part of the canon and what's not influence, again, how we argue or how we understand from a cultural perspective. So rhetoric is necessary, but only with very specific types of thinking. Campbell is the one who starts to attack logic and language, and he's trying to bring rhetoric back into it because, you know, as Smith says in the textbook, if we create a box and we put inside the box all statements in this box are false, we are now mired in question. Well, if they're all false, we can't believe them, but if we can't believe them, you know, then what do we do? We can't ever believe language, so how do we understand language and how do we use language and how are we okay even as humans with accepting that language is how all of this works and language is how we communicate it's how we make sense it's how we learn and teach culture so if this is what we need how do we get beyond all statements in this box are false how do we get to a place where we can accept that what somebody is saying is true and then how does rhetoric help so for Campbell bringing rhetoric back into and kind of mixing rhetoric and logic into this one giant category rhetoric is to enlighten or to argue to understanding awaken memory engage or please the imagination arouse or move the passions to influence the will to action or belief so he's bringing the epistemology back to rhetoric rhetoric can make knowledge rhetoric can help us understand and make decisions and that's really really important it's not just logic it's all of it and so we're calling it rhetoric again Blair again is attempting to purify the English language how do we get things better so that we can communicate better Sheridan and Austin and then eventually Watley are all focusing on style and delivery. So if we want to purify the English language, we also need to focus on style and delivery. So we have re-readings of Cicero in very specific ways, especially because Parliament has gained power. So how do we perform in specific ways? How do we categorize these deliveries and what does that mean? Watley's uh, pro is focuses on introductions are some of the most powerful ways of understanding how do we introduce ideas and how do we do it in a way that we essentially put our readers or our listeners or our viewers into the right mindset to understand the rest of the Communication Act. So if we look at um, comedy, especially stand-up comedy, what we'll see when comedians introduce jokes is we'll see kind of a combination of two or three of these approaches depending on the joke, because especially with stand-up comedy, you'll have jokes carry on for kind of little chunks of time 
time, five to 15 minutes or so, because you need the audience to pay attention. So how do we have a couple different kinds of interactions, so, I'm sorry, introductions, so that the viewers know how to understand this first joke that's introduced that takes 15 minutes for the punchline to come, and then the two or three jokes that come in the middle, so that they understand how to make sense of each of those individual jokes, so they understand the punchline, but they also see the connection back to the longer, you know, block set of those particular jokes. We use this in speeches constantly too. Um, one of the best speeches that's really, really famous for these different approaches is Frederick Douglass's uh, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. He has three very distinct sections in that particular speech and each of them have very specific introductions, but as he introduces new ideas in each of the three, um, sections, he's also using combinations of these kinds of introductions so that he can say, here's the overall gist of this first section. Here's how to understand this middle part and the connections back to the larger argument from this particular section. And then I can use an entirely new type of introduction so that I'm clearly indicating to the audience and we've switched and we've moved on. So between Sheridan and Austin and Watley, what we're focusing on is how we deliver, what our style looks like, so again with our presidential speeches, but also also, how we chunk out arguments, so we're pulling in from the sophists, how do we organize arguments in very specific ways so that the audience knows how to make sense of them, so that the audience is put in the right cultural mindset so they can understand what to do with this particular information. And last we have Bain who's attempting to explain um, effective speaking and again we're bringing Cicero back into this and now we're mixing Cicero with psychology. So what actually happens in our mind when we deliver in these ways? How do we teach people to understand types of delivery and types of speeches and then what does that do for our overall understanding? Okay, so that is chapter eight. So what we'll talk about next is how these approaches to epistemology develop modernism and then where modernism goes from here. Okay, so the next chapter is on the existentialist revolt against modernism. So what Smith starts by talking about is he kind of lines up, here's what existentialism is, here's what modernism is, here's how existentialism revolted against certain aspects of modernism, and so here's what you need to know. And then what we'll start to see towards the end of existentialism is here's where the postmodernists picked up on the ideas that the existentialists were having and also revolted in very specific ways against the modernists to end up in postmodernism. We're also going to start to see feminism kind of pick up theory-wise in here. So instead of focusing, as we saw previously with early feminists, on here are the kinds of arguments you need to make, here's the kind of Greek and Roman rhetorical theory you need to have access to, we're going to see feminism pick up from postmodernism and say, here are the ways we need to understand culture and how patriarchy is a cultural byproduct. And so when we're arguing, we're arguing against culture is a very different way of arguing. You're attacking somebody's way of life, not just an idea. So it's not just that women are less than, it's where did that idea come from? And a lot of that's going to come out of this existential revolt against modernism. So for this, what the existentialists are getting at is that we can't really understand reality. And because we can't understand reality, we have choice. And every time we make a choice, we're being existential. We're making a choice to do something. We're using language to do something. We're attempting to make sense of the world through our choices. So we're going to try them all out. Um, if we look at early development, especially with children, that's exactly what they do is they're like, what happens if I touch this? You know, and then what happens if I touch it again? What happens if I knock it over? You know, and it becomes this basically scientific experiment to figure out how the world works so they understand what their choices can do and how their choices function. We've gotten a lot better at it when we become adults, but we still do the same thing. What kinds of buttons can we push and how do we understand our choice and our freedom within that? So we're focusing a lot on Hegel who talks about the ultimate goal of um, freedom and Hegel sets up the thesis and the antithesis. So if we have a thesis and we have an antithesis, how do we end up at a synthesis so that we can have a positive moving forward? So this is Aristotle's dialectic and we're going to see Marx pick up on this very, very heavily. How do we have a clash between the bourgeois and the proletariat? And then how do we end up at a good place when the proletariat overthrow the bourgeois? Why do we need to understand it in that particular way? Um, so for Hegel, every thesis has an antithesis, which means there's one way and then there's always going to be an opposite way and the goal is to come to some happy medium. 
Um, and what we're attempting to do through this is if we understand historically that there's always a thesis and there's always an antithesis, how can we use that reading of history as a way to create better society now so that we have fewer conflicts? So we don't want a repeat of World, one, World War One. How do we understand how we end up at World War I as the synthesis for the thesis and the antithesis so that we don't end up in another world war? Obviously, we have World War II and the Cold War and a lot more after that, so we haven't quite learned this yet, but that's Hegel's whole goal with thesis and antithesis. How do we reread history in a very specific way so our cultural understanding of history so that we can get to a better synthesis? Okay, so in this whole mess of theory, because it's basically a mess of theory, what we see is existentialist theory as a whole kind of start to develop a series of ideas that make it existentialism. So the big thing that existentialists focus on through their theories is the idea of what is the subject of theory. The modernists saw humans or people or individuals as the object of theory, while the existentialists work really hard to put humans, individuals, people as the subject object of the theory. So we need to focus on the human, which focuses very, very specifically then on the idea of choice. So existentialists have both positive and negative views about all of this, and they say we're either condemned to freedom or we get to, we're allowed to make choice. Either way, because we have the person as the subject of the theory, it's the choices that that individual makes in the individualist individualistic approach to individuals that become the focus of existentialism. So here's the person. What happens when this person makes a choice? This is going to be really, really important for postmodernism. So postmodernism is of the idea that everybody can experience the world differently and that most of us have a series of different cultures that influence how we make sense of the world and then we very, very subconsciously make sense of the world through those individual cultures that we've been exposed to. So what is it that the individual knows and then how can we understand individual experiences? A lot of the debate that we see in public culture today about feminism and the need for black feminism and Latina feminism and all of these other versions of feminism with a lot of white female feminists saying, well, we don't need black feminism. And a lot of African-American women are saying, but we do because our subject position is so different just because of our, this color of our skin that we always start from a very different place. And so to understand our approach to feminism, we need to recognize that difference, that switch. We can all still be friends. We can all still agree on feminism, but we need to be more aware of individual subject positions. And most of that's coming through existentialism. So because existentialism changed the focus of theory for the very first time, we're going to care about the person. And once we do that, what happens to their choice and how does their choice operate. So it's really important that we understand this particular switch between the modernists and the existentialists as it's going to influence all modern theory, all contemporary theory would be a better word. So Kierkegaard is very focused on the idea of transcendence. He's very, one of the more optimistic existentialists, and he's focusing on how do we transcend to this higher realm, this higher being, and what he's calling gloom. So the grammar and logic of grammar and logic of the ordinary mind. Kierkegaard's really, really great at asking questions and focusing on choice and getting to this idea of transcendence. So the problem, and I know I talk about this in the other video, the problem with Kierkegaard and the problem with most existentialists, when we talk about transcendence and we're talking about transcending beyond language and beyond culture, how do we know? Is it just a moment or is it all the time? Have any of us transcended? You know, it's one of those, like, how do we, if we're not using language and we want to get beyond language, language, how do we know what it means to be transcended since most of what we know and most of how we know and most of the ways that we make sense involve language? So it's kind of a difficult position to understand for a lot of people like me who are really, really focused on this idea of language, but what Kierkegaard is trying to get at is this idea of transcendence. How do we get out of the everyday and move into this higher realm, and what does language have to do with it? And in this case, language and rhetoric and the idea of choice that's rhetoric because we're using language, we're using culture, and then we're making choices inside of that particular situation. That's all rhetorical. So we want to get beyond that into this transcendent higher order. 
Um, he talks about the modes of life. Um, you can These are all really well talked about in the book, so you guys can just look over the notes. Okay, our next existentialist, and probably one of the more famous, is Sartre. So Sartre is more on the pessimistic side of existentialism because we are condemned to freedom. We have no choice but to decide. And for Sartre, that's a really, really important idea. We can't not do anything. We have to do something, otherwise we would just kind of wither away. So it's the responsibility of all men and the responsibility for men to make decisions on behalf of all men. So Sartre wants to, since we're condemned to this realm of having to make choice, how do we make better choices that are better for everybody? And that's where his idea of transcendence is. And that's why rhetoric for Sartre is so important. How do we get people to a place where they can recognize the goal of their decision as being on behalf of all men? While he dated an uber-feminist, he still does focus on all men, men being the only beings that can act in the public sphere, which at the time period is very true. So a lot of what he talks about is how we self-persuade ourselves to not do this, how we self-persuade ourselves out of responsibility, what anxiety causes, um, and then what it means to actually be authentic as an existentialist and be authentic in our choices so that we're making authentic choices that are good for all people. And then how do we get to that authentic self, bringing in Aristotle's ethos as a part of our rhetorical act? Heidegger starts talking about language as the house of being. So if we bring language back into this, how do we use language to get to this idea of authenticity? So he's talking about hermeneutic phenomenology. So what is, how do we observe? How do we understand science? How do we understand the spirit? How do we have faith? And how do we have intuition? And where do all these ideas come from? And then how do our choices impact all of that? And how do we become authentic in doing this? So he extends Sartre's authenticity into the optimistic side and then he also extends it into authentic listening so how do we become better listeners and how do we not use our innate judgment and our innate bias when we're listening so that we can be more open to other people's experiences so that when we make our choices they can actually be authentic choices so how do we draw on SART and use listening as an approach to making us better choice makers um, so different ideas of authenticity and inauthenticity. Jaspers and Buber start to bring in ideas of power. This is obviously going to heavily influence the postmodernists with their idea of power. So if we have an authentic subject and we have an inauthentic subject, where's the power? How do we gain power when we need it? How do we enact power? How do we understand power? Where does all of that fit in this particular conversation? So what we're really going for with a lot of this is the idea that freedom and freedom of choice forces us to make choices. And in us as individuals making choices, that puts us as individuals at the center of theory, and that's the focus of existentialism. So we have this subjective approach, so now what do we do to make better authentic discussions and how does rhetoric function in that? If you have any questions, let me know. Um, you can obviously tweet at me or I'll see you guys in the discussion boards.